Uh, now, touching this business of old Jeeves, my man, you know, now how do we stand? Lots of people think I'm much too dependent on him. My Aunt Agatha, in fact, has even gone so far as to call him my keeper. Well, why not, I say, why not? Every man's a genius. From the collar upwards, he stands alone. I gave up trying to run my own affairs within a week of his coming to me. That was about, um, well, half a dozen years ago. Oh, yes. Oh, I remember directly after the rather rummy business of Florence Cray, my Uncle Willie his book and Edwin, the boy's scout. <laughs> I always remember that morning he came. It so happened that the night before, I'd been present at a rather cheery little supper, and I was feeling rather pretty rocky. On top of this, I was trying to read a book Florence Cray had given me. She'd been one of the house party at Eastby, my uncle's place in Shropshire, you know. And two or three days before I left, we got engaged. I was due back at the end of the week, and I knew she'd expect me to have finished the book by then. You see, she was particularly keen on boosting me a bit nearer her own plane of intellect. She was a girl with a wonderful profile, but steeped to the gills in serious purpose. Can't give you a better idea of the way things stood than by telling you that the book she'd given me to read was called Types of Ethical Theory, and that when I opened it at random, I stuck a page beginning. Got it here, listen. The, the postulate or common understanding involved in speech is certainly coextensive in the obligation it carries with the social organism of which language is the instrument and the ends of which is an effort to subserve. <laughs> well, I'm all perfectly true, no doubt, but uh, not the sort of thing to spring on a lad with a morning head, what? Oh, come in. I was sent by the agency, sir. I will give you to understand what you require, is that it? I'd have preferred an undertaker, but I told him to stagger in, and he floated noiselessly through the doorway like a healing zephyr. He just streamed in. He had a grave, sympathetic face, as if he, too, knew what it was to suck with the lads. Oh. Excuse me, sir. He seemed to flicker and wasn't there any longer. Presently, he came back with a glass on a tray. If you would drink this, sir, it's a little preparation of my own invention. It is the Worcester sauce that gives it its color. The raw egg makes it nutritious. The red pepper gives it its bite. Gentlemen have told me that they've found it extremely invigorating after a late evening. I would have clutched at anything that looked like a lifeline that morning. Sir? For a moment I felt as if somebody had touched off a bomb inside the old bean and was strolling down my throat with a lighted torch. And then everything seemed suddenly to get all right. The sun shone in through the window, birds twittered in the treetops, and generally speaking, hope dawned once more. You're engaged. Thank you, sir. The name is Jeeves. You can start at once? Immediately, sir. Uh, good, because I'm due down at Eastby in Shropshire. Very good, sir. He looked past me at the mantelpiece. That is an excellent likeness of Lady Florence Craig, sir. It is two years since I saw her ladyship. Huh? I was at one time in Lord Wapleston's employment. I attended my resignation because I could not see eye to eye with his lordship in his desire to dine in dress trousers, a flannel shirt and a shooting coat. He couldn't tell me anything I didn't know about the old boy's eccentricity. This Lord Wapleston was Florence's father. He was the old bastard who, a few years later, came down to breakfast one morning, lifted the first cover he saw, said, Eggs, 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 damn all eggs, and instantly legged it off to France, never to return to the bosom of his family again. If there was a flaw, so to speak, in the pure joy of being engaged to Florence, it was the fact that she rather took after her father, and one was never certain when she might erupt. She had a wonderful profile, yeah. Lady Florence and I are engaged, Jeeves. Indeed, sir. You know, there was a kind of rummy something about his manner, perfectly all right and all that, but not what you'd call chirpy. It somehow gave me the impression that he wasn't keen on Florence. Jeez, we should be going down to Eastby this afternoon. Can you manage it? Certainly, sir. Which suit will you wear for the journey? This one. I had on rather a spikely young check that morning, to which I was a good deal attached. I fancied it, in fact, more than a little. It was perhaps rather sudden till you got used to it, but nevertheless, an extremely sound effort, which many lads at the club and elsewhere had admired unrestrainedly. Very good, sir. Well, I wasn't going to have any of that sort of thing, by Jove. I'd seen so many cases of fellows who'd become perfect slaves to their valets. 
I remember poor old Aubrey Fothergill telling me, with absolute tears in his eyes, poor chap, that he'd been compelled to give up a favourite pair of brown shoes simply because Meekin, his man, disapproved of them. You have to keep these fellows in their place, don't you know? You have to work the good old iron hand and the velvet glove wheels. If you give them a WhatsApp name, they take a thing of me. Don't you like this suit, Jeeves? No, oh, yes, sir. Oh. Well, what don't you like about it? It's a very nice suit, sir. Well, 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 what's wrong with it? Out with it, dash it. If I might make the suggestion, sir, a simple brown or blue with a hint of some quiet twill. What absolute rot. Very good, sir. Perfectly blithering, my dear man. As you say, sir. I felt as if I'd stepped on the place where the last stair ought to have been, but wasn't. I, I felt defiant, if you know what I mean, but, but there, there didn't seem anyone to defy. Easby wasn't one of those country houses you read about in the society novels, where young girls are lured on to play baccarat and then skinned to the bone of their jewellery and so on. The house party I'd left consisted entirely of law-abiding births like myself. Besides, my uncle wouldn't have let anything of that kind go on in his house. He was a rather stiff, precise sort of old boy who liked a quiet life. He was just finishing a history of the family or something, which he'd been working on for the past year, and didn't stir much from the library. But when I got to Easley, Florence was in her room, so I trickled into the smoking room and waited, and presently in she came. The glance showed me she was perturbed and even peeved. Darling! Don't! I, I attempted the good old embrace, but she sidestepped me like a bantam weight. What's the matter? Everything's the matter. Bertie, you remember asking me when you left to make myself pleasant to your uncle? Yes. Uh, the idea being, of course, that as at the time I was more or less dependent on Uncle Willoughby, I couldn't let a woman marry without his approval. So I had told her to make an effort and assassinate the old boy. You told me it would please him particularly if I asked him to read me some of his history of the family. Wasn't he pleased? He was delighted. He finished writing the thing yesterday afternoon and read me nearly all of it last night. I have never had such a shock in my life. The book is an outrage. It is impossible. It is horrible. But dash it, the family weren't as bad as all that. It is not a history of the family at all. Your uncle has written his reminiscences. He calls them recollections of a long life. Oh, I began to understand. Uncle Willoughby had been somewhat on the Tabasco side as a young man, and it began to look as if he might have turned out something pretty fruity if he'd started recollecting his long life. If half of what he has written is true, your uncle's youth must have been perfectly appalling. The moment we began to read, he plunged into a most scandalous story of how he and my father were thrown out of a music hall in 1907. Oh, why were they? I decline to tell you why. The book is full of stories like that. There's a dreadful one about Lord Emsworth. Lord Emsworth? Not the one we know. A most respectable old Johnny, don't you know? Doesn't do a thing nowadays but dig in the garden. The very same. That is what makes the book so unspeakable. There is a story about Sir Stanley Gervais Gervais at Rocheville Gardens, which is ghastly in its perfection of detail. It seems that Sir Stanley... But I can't tell you. Oh, have a dash. No. Oh, well, I shouldn't worry. No publisher will print the book if it's as bad as that. On the contrary. Your uncle told me that all negotiations are settled with Riggs and Ballinger, and he's sending off the manuscript tomorrow for immediate publication. Father appears in nearly every story in the book. What's to be done? The manuscript must be intercepted before it reaches Riggs and Ballinger and destroyed. This sounded rather sporting. How are you going to do it? How can I do it? Didn't I tell you the parcel goes off tomorrow? I am going to the Murgatroyd's dance tonight and shall not be back till Monday. You must do it. What? Do you mean to say you refuse to help me, Bertie? No, but, but I, I say... It's quite simple. But, but, but even if I... What I mean is, of course, of course, anything I can do, but if you know what I mean... I, you say you want to marry me, Bertie? You, yes, of course, but still... I will never marry you if those recollections are published. But Florence, old thing... I mean it. You may look on it as a test, Bertie. If you have the resource and courage to carry this thing through, 
I will take it as evidence that you are not the vapid and shiftless person most people think you. But, but suppose Uncle Willoughby catches me at it. He cut me off without a bob. If you care more for your uncle's money than for me... Oh, no, no. no. Rather not. Very well, then. The parcel containing the manuscript will, of course, be placed on the hall table tomorrow for Oakshot to take to the village with the letters. All you have to do is to take it away and destroy it. Then your uncle will think it has been lost in the post. Oh, hasn't he got a copy of it? No, it has not been typed. He's sending the manuscript just as he wrote it. But, but look, I say he could write it all over again. Oh, as if he would have the energy. But, but if to... you are going to do nothing but make absurd objections, Bertie... Well, I'm really pointing things out. Well, don't. Once and for all, will you do me this quite simple act of kindness? Why not get Edwin to do it? Keep it in the family, kind of, don't you know? Besides, it would be a boon to the kid. Edwin was her young brother, a ferret-faced kid whom I had disliked since birth. He was 14 now, just joined the Boy Scouts, always in a sort of fever because he was dropping behind schedule with his daily acts of kindness. What I mean is, Edwin would do it so much better than I would. These Boy Scouts are up to all sorts of dodges. They spur, don't you know, and take cover and creep about and whatnot. Bertie, will you or will you not do this perfectly trivial thing for me? If not, say so now and let us end this farce of pretending that you care a snap of the fingers for me. Oh, dear old soul, I love you devotedly. Then will you or will you not? Oh, all right. All right, I... All right, all right, all right. I've often wondered since how those murderer fellows managed to keep in shape while they're contemplating their next effort. I had a much simpler sort of job on hand and the thought of it rattled me to such an extent of the night watches that I was a perfect wreck the next day. Dark circles under the eyes, I give you my word. I had to call on Jeeves to rally round me with one of those lifesavers of his. It wasn't until nearly four that Uncle Willoughby toddled out of the library with a parcel under his arm, put it on the table and toddled off again. I was hiding a bit to the southeast at the moment behind a suit of armour. I bounded out, legged it for the table, then I nipped upstairs to hide the swag. I charged in like a mustang and nearly stabbed my toe on young blighter Edwin, the boy scout. He was standing at my chest of drawers, confound him, messing about with my ties. Hello. What are you doing here? I'm tidying your room. Actually, it's my act of kindness for last Saturday. Last Saturday? You must be a comfort to one and all. Well, I shouldn't bother about tidying the room. I like tidying it. It's not a bit of trouble, really. Well, look, it is quite tidy now. Not so tidy as I shall make it. Look, there's something much kinder than that which you could do. You, you see that box of cigars? Look, take it down to the smoking room and snip off the ends for me. That will save me no end of trouble. Well, stagger along, lady. He seemed a bit doubtful, but he staggered. I shoved the parcel into a drawer, locked it, trousered the key and felt better. I might be a chump, but dash it. I could out-general a mere kid with a face like a ferret. I went downstairs again. Just as I was passing the smoking room door, out curveted Edwin. It seemed to me that if he wanted to do a real act of kindness, he would commit suicide. I'm snipping them. Snip on, snip on. Do you like them snipped too much or only a bit? Oh, um, a medium. All right, are they getting on then? I should. Fellows who know all about that sort of thing, detectives and so on, would tell you that the most difficult thing in the world is to get rid of the body. When one came down to it, how the deuce can a chap destroy a great chunky mass of paper in somebody else's house in the middle of summer? I couldn't ask to have a fire in my bedroom with a thermometer in the 80s, and if I didn't burn the thing, how else could I get rid of it? The fellows on the battlefield eat dispatches to keep them from falling into the hands of the enemy, but it would take me a year to eat Uncle Willoughby's recollections. The only thing seemed to be to leave the parcel in the drawer and hope for the best. I didn't think Uncle Willoughby would have time to suspect that anything had gone wrong until Saturday morning, but early on Friday evening he stepped out of the library as I was passing and asked me to step in. He was looking considerably rattled. Bertie, an exceedingly disturbing thing has happened. As you know, I dispatched the manuscript of my book to Mrs. Riggs and Ballinger, the publishers, yesterday afternoon. It should have reached them by the first post this morning. I telephoned to Mrs. Riggs and Ballinger a few moments ago. To my consternation, they informed me that they were not yet in receipt of my manuscript. Very wrong. I've spoken to Oakshot, who took the rest of the letters to the post office, and he cannot recall seeing it there. Sounds funny. 
Bertie, shall I tell you what I suspect? What's that? The suspicion will no doubt sound to you incredible, but I incline to the belief that the parcel's been stolen. Oh, I say, surely not. Then the whole thing's inexplicable. We brooded for a bit. Uncle Willoughby potted about the room, registering baffledness, while I sat sucking a cigarette. After a while, I couldn't suck it any longer. I lit another cigarette and started for a stroll in the grounds, by way of cooling off. It was one of those still evenings you get in the summer when you can hear a snail clear its throat a mile away. The sun was sinking over the hills and the gnats were fooling about all over the place, and everything smelled rather topping, what with the falling dew and so on. And I was just beginning to feel a little soothed by the peace of it when suddenly I heard my name spoken. It's about birth. The loathsome voice of young blighted Edwin. I realised that it came from the library. My stroll had taken me within a few yards of the open window. It was the work of a moment to chuck away my cigarette, swear a bit, leap about ten yards, dive into a bush, and stand there with my ears flapping. About Bertie and your parcel. I heard you talking to him just now. I believe he's got it. What do you mean, boy? I was discussing the disappearance of my manuscript with Bertie only a moment back. And he professed himself as perplexed by the mystery of myself. Well, I was in his room yesterday afternoon, doing him an act of kindness, and he came in with a partner. I could see it, so he tried to keep it behind his back. And then he asked me to go to the smoking room to set some cigars for him. And about two minutes afterwards, he came down, and he wasn't carrying anything. So it must be in his room. It sounds incredible. So I go and look in his room. I'm sure the parcel's there. But what could be his motive for perpetrating this extraordinary theft? But Cryptomania? Impossible. I cannot believe that Bertie would uh, go about teaching things. Well, I'm sure he's got the parcel. I'll tell you what you might do. You might say that Mr. Barkley wired that he left something there. He had Bertie's in there. You might say that you wanted to look for it. It's impossible. I... I didn't wait to hear any more. Things were getting too hot. I sneaked softly out of my bush and raced for the front door. I sprinted up to my room and made for the drawer where I had put the parcel. And then I found that I hadn't a key. I'd shifted it to my evening trousers the night before. Where the dickens were my evening things? Jeez, must have taken them away to brush. I had just rang the bell when... Oh, Bertie, I have um, received a telegram from Barclay, who occupied this room in your absence, asking me to forward his... Um, a uh, cigarette case, uh, which it would appear he inadvertently omitted to take with him when he left the house. I cannot find it downstairs, and it's therefore occurred to me that he may have left it in this room. I will, um, uh, just take a look around. It was one of the most disgusting spectacles I've ever seen. This white-haired old man, who should have been thinking of the hereafter, standing there lying like an actor. I, I haven't seen it anywhere. Uh, nevertheless, I will search... I must, um, spare no effort. I, I should have seen if it had been here, what? It may have escaped your notice. It is, um, possibly in one of the drawers. He began to nose about. He pulled out drawer after drawer, pottering around like an old bloodhound. I just stood there, losing weight every moment. He came to the drawer where the parcel was. This appears to be locked. Uh, yes, yes, I shouldn't bother about that one. It's, uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's locked and all that sort of thing. You have not the key? I fancy, sir, that this must be the key that you require. It was in the pocket of your evening trousers. I could have massacred the man. Thank you. Not at all, sir. I shut my eyes. No, there's nothing here. The drawer's empty. Thank you, Bertie. I hope I've not disturbed you. I fancy, um, Barclay must have taken his case with him after all. When he'd gone, I shut the door carefully. <sighs> uh, Jeeves? Sir? Uh, did you, uh, was there... Um, have you by any chance... I um... removed the parcel this morning, sir. Oh, why? I considered it more prudent, sir. Oh, of course. I, I suppose all this seems tolerably rummy to you, Jean. Not at all, sir. I chanced to overhear you and Lady Florence speaking of the matter the other evening, sir. Did you, by Joe? Yes, sir. Well, Jeeves, I, I think that, on the whole, if you were to, as it were, 
freeze onto that parcel until we get back to London. Exactly, sir. And then we might, uh, so to speak, uh, chuck it away somewhere, what? Precisely, sir. I'll leave it in your hands. Entirely, sir. You know, Jeeves, you're by way of being a topper. I endeavour to give satisfaction, sir. One in a million, by Jove. It's very kind of you to say so, sir. Well, well, that's about all, then, I think. Very good, sir. Florence came back on Monday. I didn't see her until we were all having tea in the hall. Well, Bertie? It's all right. You have destroyed the manuscript? Not exactly, but... Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean I haven't absolutely... Bertie, your manner is furtive. It's all right. It's this way. Oh, Bertie, oh. a most remarkable thing, Bertie. I've just been speaking with Mr. Biggs on the telephone and he tells me he received my manuscript by the first post this morning. I cannot imagine what can have caused the delay. Our postal facilities are extremely inadequate in the rural districts. I shall write to headquarters about it. Uncle Willoughby meandered back to the library and there was a silence that you could have dug bits out of with a spoon. I cannot understand it. I cannot understand it, by Jove. I can. I can understand it perfectly, Bertie. You preferred to lose me rather than risk losing the money. Perhaps you did not think I meant what I said. I meant every word. Our engagement is ended. But I said... Not another word. But Florence so fit. I do not wish to hear any more. There was a time when I thought that, with patience, you might be moulded into something worthwhile. I see now that you are impossible. When I'd collected the debris to some extent, I went to my room and rang. Jeeves? Yes, sir? Uh, Jeeves, that parcel has arrived in London. Yes, sir. Did you send it? Yes, sir. What? I acted for the best, sir. I think that both you and Lady Florence overestimated the danger of people being offended at being mentioned in Mr. Willoughby's recollections. It has been my experience, sir, that the normal person enjoys seeing his or her name in print, irrespective of what is said about them. I have an aunt, sir, who a few years ago was a martyr to swollen limbs. She tried Walkinshaw's Supreme Ointment and obtained considerable relief, so much so that she sent them an unsolicited testimonial. Her pride at seeing her photograph in the daily papers in connection with descriptions of her lower limbs before taking, which were nothing less than revolting, was so intense that it led me to believe that publicity of whatever sort is what nearly everybody desires. Moreover, if you have ever studied psychology, sir, you will know that respectable old gentlemen are by no means averse to having it advertised that they were extremely wild in their youth. I have an uncle. Do you know that Lady Florence has broken off her engagement with me? Indeed, sir. Indeed, sir. You're sat. Very good, sir. <clears throat> As I am no longer in your employment, sir, I can speak freely without appearing to take a liberty. In my opinion, you and Lady Florence were quite unsuitably matched. Her ladyship is of a highly determined and arbitrary temperament, quite opposed to your own. I was in Lord Wapleston's service for nearly a year, during which time I had ample opportunities of studying her ladyship. You would not have been happy, sir. Get out! I think you would also have found her educational methods a little trying, sir. I have glanced at the book her ladyship gave you. It has been lying on your table since our arrival, and it is, in my opinion, quite unsuitable. Get out! You would not have enjoyed it. And I have it from her ladyship's own maid that it was her intention to start you almost immediately upon Nietzsche. You would not have enjoyed Nietzsche, sir. He is fundamentally unsound. Get out! Very good, sir. It's rummy how sleeping on a thing often makes you feel quite different about it. It happened to me over and over again. Somehow or other, when I woke up next morning, the old heart didn't feel half so broken as it had done. It was a perfectly topping day, and there was something about the way the sun came in the window and the row the birds were kicking up in the ivy that made me half wonder whether Jeeves wasn't right. 
After all, though she had a wonderful profile, was it such a catch being engaged to Florence Cray as the casual observer might imagine? I began to realise that my ideal wife was something quite different, something a lot more clinging and drooping and prattling and, and what not. I got as far as this in thinking the thing out when that book of hers caught my eye. I opened it and I give you my honest word, this was what hit me. Of the two antithetic terms in Greek philosophy, one only was real and self-subsisting, and that one was ideal thought as opposed to that which it... Well, well, I mean to say, what? And Nietzsche, from all accounts, a lot worse than that. Jeez, I said, when he came in with my morning tea. I've been thinking it over. You're engaged again. Thank you, sir. I sucked down a cheerful mouthful. A great respect for this bloke's judgment began to soak through me. Oh, geez. About that check suit. Uh, yes, sir. Is it really a frost? A trifle too bizarre, sir, in my opinion. But lots of fellows have asked me who my tailor is. Doubtless in order to avoid him, sir. Well, he's supposed to be one of the best men in London. I'm saying nothing about his moral character, sir. I hesitated a bit. I had a feeling that I was passing into this chappie's clutches, and that if I caved in now, I should become just like poor old Aubrey Fothergill, unable to call my soul my own. On the other hand, this was obviously a cove of rare intelligence, and it would be a comfort, in a lot of ways, to have him doing the thinking for me. I made up my mind. All right, Jeeves, you know. Give the valley thing away to somebody. He looked down at me, rather like a father gazing tenderly at the wayward child. Thank you, sir. I gave it to the under-gardener last night. A little more tea, sir? <laughs> 